it's all about what they want, right? Right, 100%. What do you want, right? What's your vision? I'm not here to judge, right? Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. Just tell us what you want. Welcome to another episode of the Athlete Investment Podcast. Man, I got a very, very special guest. Uh, I said last time, I said in the last episode how it's not only going to be athletes on here, it's going to be high level executives as well, too. Um, and this episode, man, I'm extremely excited about because, uh, you know, it's not only going to be about the um, about the lack of financial literacy in our you know country and in our culture, but also, you know, it'll be very informational. Um, this episode also is very important to me because it's my financial advisor as well, too. So, I mean, you know, I got Brian Jackson here. So Brian Jackson. Um, man, thanks for joining us first and foremost. Thanks for um, having me, Kim. I appreciate it. Man, no, for real. Like, I really appreciate uh, you coming on this episode. And then also, you know, I appreciate you uh, for helping me out as well, too. I mean, you guys are at this very high end, high level. You are part of a high level uh, financial advisor firm, a wealth management firm. Mm -hmm. And I just know people in my position. Uh, you know, I obviously I made some money on the field, but you know, you y'all usually, you know, y'all usually have a minimum of what y'all bring in, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, just tell just tell us a little bit more about like you know your background, kind of why you chose this path. I think that's really important to touch on. Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. man. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I tell people that, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't, I didn't say that I wanted to be a, a financial advisor. You know, I didn't even know that it was a a career to be honest with you I mean it was it was something that I kind of found out about later in life but you know um, I wasn't born you know understanding money right and a, a lot of us are not you know born into families that have a lot of you know financial um, literacy and so you know my story um, kind of starts with uh, my mother and, and I've told you this story I mean you know She's from Louisiana. We're all from Louisiana. And uh, she grew up poor, right? She's very poor from rural Louisiana. Um, but she was very smart, very, very, very intelligent, highly intelligent. And she got an academic scholarship to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so um, she graduated in two and a half years, cum laude, um, got her master's, got into corporate America, and rose to the top. They loved her. Okay. Right, right, right. Um, and she made a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. And was your dad there? Um, they were there. Uh, he was there uh, in the early part, uh, but they got divorced when I was in, I want to say that was seventh grade. Yeah, yeah. How um, tough was that? I know that, like, you know, obviously my background, a lot of people know it that my dad left when I was two, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, and, you know, and, I don't. I think that we know now how big of a father figure plays in you know in people' roles, especially yes. in the black community. Absolutely, and how we like it. Mm -hmm. How like how how big of a role did your mom have to fill in from your dad not being there? Oh, I mean, you know, big time. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like um, single moms uh, deserve so much, so much respect. I mean, you know, as as a as a father myself now. You know, as a parent yeah. myself now, um, actually having someone to help, I can only imagine having to do it by myself. Um, but no, I mean, you know, my mom had to play both roles, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, my dad had more financial literacy than my mother, but, you know, he, he wasn't there. Right, 100%. Right? Yeah. To kind of guide her along. Yeah. Um, and so when she... You know, I'm gonna kind of give you a little bit of a backstory on that. So, you know, he was the breadwinner. Okay, so she graduates, she gets in the working world. Uh, my dad's in the working world. He's the breadwinner. Um, they want to start a family, so she puts her career on hold. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so he's the breadwinner. He's working for a big paper company, and uh, we're moving around the country following him. And um, then he gets laid off mm -hmm. and um, then he comes into this situation where he's he's struggling to be the breadwinner, right? And so my mother 
turns her career switch back on, right? right, right, right. And then she starts taking off, and then my my dad is is now working at the same company that she's at, and and she's at a a different level than him. Oh, that's crazy. Right. So that's now, crazy. So now she's at a higher level than than where he was. Right. And so the roles are reversed. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it created friction in their marriage. Mm. And um, I really, you know, I really believe that's, I believe that was the driving force behind, you know, separation. Right. Mm. Damn. Um, a lot of men don't know how to handle a situation like that. Right. Where, uh, you know, they're not the, they're not the provider. Hundred percent. Right. I mean, that's tough. Yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, like yeah. what's my role here? Like, if I'm not the main provider, you know, a lot of men struggle with that, and and so that was the situation in my household. Um, but you know, in, either way, she they split, and that was super tough. Um, it was hard on me because I was the oldest child. My brother and sister were probably too young to realize what was going on, um, but I knew exactly what was going on, and it hurt. Um, but you know, um, I'm living with my mom, my brother and my sister, and she's trying to build a career, mm -hmm. um, and you know, become this high level executive and raise three kids on her own. I, I still do. don't know how yeah. she did it. Yeah. I still don't know how she did it because she, I mean, she's been on the cover of magazines. I mean, she was at that level. Oh, she was big time. Yeah. She was big time. And, um, and what career was it in again? Insurance. Insurance. Okay. Yeah. She yeah, worked yeah. for a big fortune five insurance company. Okay. And, um, you know, but she and she did that with you know three kids, um, which is you know to this day is really fascinating. But you know she um, she did well. Um, we never really lacked for anything, mm -hmm. um, you know. And um, but she retired early, mm -hmm. okay, really early, like in her early fifties. And um, you know, it, she, she had a very nice pension because she was an executive. Okay. Right, right, right. Um, but, um, you know, for the most part, that was the vast majority of her, you know, of her finances. Right, right, right. Um, you know, she had some assets, but that was the primary driver of her income in retirement was that big pension. And, um, you know, thing about pensions, came on is that, you know, they don't change. Right. And what do you mean by that? So, like... When you retire, if you are fortunate enough to be one of the few people in this country that actually has a pension, hundred percent. Okay, um, because they're rare. Um, your pension payment never changes; it's fixed. I get it. Okay. Yep, okay. Yep, yep. So if it's you know six thousand dollars a month or ten thousand dollars a month, that's it. That's what mm -hmm. it's going to be forever. And you know what we what we know is life gets more expensive every year. Right. hundred percent. Through inflation. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, things just get more expensive. You weren't paying, um, you know, uh, you're paying less for, you know, a gallon of gas or rent or clothes or food. You were paying less 10, 20 years ago than what you're paying now. hundred percent. Okay. Shoot, I remember back in the day, the, a bag of, you know what I'm saying? A small bag of Cheetos was, <laughs> was 25 cents. Now right. they all the way up to a dollar for mm -hmm. it. For a min, you know the many yeah. bags of Cheetos. Oh, absolutely. Um, so just off of that one one example, that's when I knew. That's when I first found out that about the word inflation. Yeah, I think that's a word in our community that's just now starting to become a big thing. But you know, people don't even realize that man. It's always it's always been inflation. It yes. just hasn't been this bad. Yes, absolutely. And you know, you have to account for that in your mm -hmm. life and in your lifestyle. Hundred percent. And so, um, you know, you know, long story short, I mean, she's, you know, she started off with a certain lifestyle, and she's had to change that lifestyle, right? Just because of inflation, right? Right. right. I mean, there's a fixed amount of money there, and she would always say to me, you know, I, I just wish someone would have given me some more guidance when I was making all of that money when I had all that income, right? And that always bothered me um, because I mean, I didn't know, I mm -hmm. didn't know anything, and um, you know, knowledge is power. And I didn't, I didn't have the knowledge at that time. Um, and so I'm thinking about this and it's kind of like, okay, this is a, this is a corporate executive. And, you know, if she didn't have the knowledge, 
you know, what about the average blue collar everyday 100%. American citizen? Right? And and what age was this at? What age did you decide that you wanted to be a wealth management? So, or, you know, essentially, man, I mean, I started off, I mean, I walked away from corporate America myself when I was, um, I want to say I was 30. Okay. Um, I had been in corporate America for seven years. And um, I just knew that there was something more for me out there, um, just based on my my personality type. And I, I I got into the world of entrepreneurship, and it was heavily insurance based. Okay. Yeah. And then that transitioned into four hundred one ks. Okay. And then from the four hundred one ks, it transitioned into individual wealth management. So it was almost like a it was like a transition, right? 100%, yeah. It wasn't like I just said one day, you know what, I want to be a, a wealth manager. It just was a slow transition. But my decision to pursue the CFP marks was because um, I wanted to be the best, right? I wanted right, to be, right. I wanted to be, um, you know, more elite, right? More, right, hundred percent, yeah. right? More, uh, more competent, and so. Um, you know that's that's what drove that decision, but um, you know I'd say that uh, you know it's my thirties, right? Mm -hmm. right around the time that you know she was going through her transition, and um, you know it's it's been great, right? Mm -hmm. It's been great, um, but that was a big driver behind it. You know, just the competency and being <laughs> able to tell people, you know, the things that they need to know right. for their own financial health, right? Right. And I mean, there's definitely a formula to it. Yeah, man, because, you know, uh, uh, one thing, and I don't know if I ever told you this, but I really admire your story because, you know, I say all the time, and I know y'all hear me say this a lot, is that, um, you know, growing up as a black, as a black person or as a black man in this society, uh, we look up to our entertainers, yeah. you know? So mm -hmm. so we grew up and, and that's what we strive to become is some sort of entertainer, whether it's a a rapper or like yeah. an actor or you know sports that's what we look up to but you didn't choose that route and and, and that's rare you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of i don't want to say surprising because surprising can kind of come up as a bad word but it's very rare yeah so why didn't you choose that route yeah i mean you know i i, I think that you know it's it's what you see right it's what i saw growing up right i mean the success stories that we're exposed to that attract us the most are the stories of, you know, the actors or the athletes that are making, you know, multi-million dollars and they're, you know, they're wealthy and they're famous and mm -hmm. everybody wants to be around them. And, you know, it's natural for a kid to, to want that. Right. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, I did play, I did play college football and, um, you know, I, it, it didn't it didn't progress to you know the nfl and at that point you've got to make a decision right like you know what what's next right 100 yes. percent. and so um you know that for me it, it wasn't so much a, de a, a decision it was more of okay um if, if i'm not going to make it or excel in this particular area then i'm going to excel in in this right. particular area, right. right? And, you know, the thing about an athlete is, especially when you make it beyond high school or you make it beyond college is, you know, you you know what it takes to be elite. Mm -hmm. You know what it takes to be different than everybody else, right? I mean, there's only so many spots in the NFL, there's only so many spots in college, right? And to get to, to each, you know, subsequent level, um, you've got to work that much harder. And I so I just, that. you know, I got from the high school to the college level and, you know, I just carried that same work ethic into the working world. Right. Yeah. And, you know, similar to you. Right. I mean, you've you carried it to college. You took it to the NFL and I carried it into, you know, to your entrepreneurial career. Right. And so that's an advantage that I think a, a lot of athletes have is um, whether they know it or not, they have a drive. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that is yeah. just off the charts, right? Yeah. Um, and you know they do things differently than other people. Yeah, they make sacrifices that other people aren't willing to make, right? Um, and you know people don't you know people think that oh you know uh, 
you know, an elite athlete, a DeAndre Hopkins or whoever. I mean, they don't put in the work. They're just naturally gifted. No, they're putting in work. They put in the work. We, we put in the work. Right. <laughs> I mean, you work. know, you put in the work. You put in the work. To get yeah. to the NFL. I mean, you put in work. Yeah. You know, my son is uh, my son is in, in high school now, and he's highly recruited. And, yeah. You know, we go to visit these, these colleges, and, you know, you, you get to see um, – how much work goes into 100% that right 100%. into being an athlete and an elite athlete and um you know so yeah i mean it's it's a major advantage of an athlete um your work ethic and you just you have to channel that so right you know if you're if you're a pro athlete now you're channeling that into your career into your craft right and, and before we spring forward to your corporate world let's let's back let's backtrack cuz i know you you just touched on your son Mm -hmm. What what is it that you know you see in him right now that you uh, that you see in him that you know that he's going to make it to the next level? Because you know uh, I don't know if people really know, but your son is like one of the highest recruits in Texas right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so tell us a little bit about that about your son and kind of the <laughs> journey that he's going through right now. Yeah, I mean he's a highly recruited running back. I mean he's got thirty one scholarship offers. You know, pretty much all Power Five schools. And, um, you know, he's, you know, so my, so you don't know what your, if your kid's going to be an athlete or not. I mean, it didn't really matter to me. And, you know, we, um, I didn't push him in any sports or let him play soccer and whatever, but, um, <laughs> just kind of a quick side story. We got him into flag football and, um, you know, they would give him the ball and he'd just kind of stand there and cry. You know, and I'm just kind of sitting here like, oh, man. I Like, oh, man. Okay. So, but this is my kid. I love him. And, you know, I just want him to be out here because I understand the power of sports and what it can mean for you. 100%. Yeah. You know, and how you can carry those lessons with you for the rest of your life. And But, um, you know, he wasn't doing a, a, anything major at that time. And one day they gave him the ball, and I don't know what it is that clicked. Mm -hmm. But, you know... I just yelled from the sidelines. I just said, run. You're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Run. And he took off and no one could catch him. And I guess it clicked in his head that he could be a pretty good athlete. And then from there, he just took off. Right, right. And um, he's just continued to progress and progress and progress. And he hates to lose. He's super driven. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I remember one time we were playing a game and he made a tackle. And he was just laying face down on the ground. And everyone was kind of looking like, is he hurt? Right. And he just stayed there. And we were all like, is he hurt? And then we started to walk out on the field. And then he just slowly got up. And we just realized he was just leaving it all on the field. He was just. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. he's just, he's going to leave it all out there. So, you know, he, he continues to improve and improve and improve. And um, he's very driven. He's very focused. And. You know, I don't know if he's going to make it to the mm -hmm. NFL or not. I'd love for him to. I know that's his dream. Yeah. But, you know, right now we just want to get him to the next level and yeah. then take it from there. Yeah, he's played running back, right? Yeah, he plays running back. And how many offers he got? 31. <laughs> yeah, he's got 31. How many, how many SEC? Do we, do, we, do we have any SEC? Yeah, there's a lot of SEC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, he's big time there. Yeah. He's big time. Yeah, yeah. Alabama and all those guys, man. Um, Ole Miss and Arkansas and... You know, all of them. I mean, yeah. not all of them, but a lot of them. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so, you know, he's, but you got to deal with that, right? I mean, 100%, you, you got to, you know, keep him focused. I mean, it's like, you know, it's academics and football, you know. You're, right, right, right. You know, it's, you're not in the, you're not in the league yet, right? Right, I mean, you gotta, yep. You've got to focus yep. on both and, you know, um, make sure that he understands that you're on a different path, right? right and right. you can't do the things that your friends do. 100%. That aren't yep, on the yep, same path. and. Yep. You know, all that's what we're dealing with right now. But yeah, yeah, yeah man, I, I, it's definitely a tough situation. It's definitely a tough situation because, you know, you want to prepare him for life after football, but also, I think we all know that you know that we can really do anything that we put our minds to. So you don't want to be a hypocrite and tell him like, hey, like you need to have a backup plan because you know he can make it if yeah. he really, really want to make mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, what skills are you passing down to him mm -hmm. to prepare him for, you know, the identity crisis that athletes face after, you know, after they have to walk away? Yeah, 
And, you know, and I can't even hardly talk to him about, you know, that identity crisis because yeah. he doesn't want to hear it. Yep. yep. Right? Yeah, that's tough. You know, you talk to a 16-year-old kid, they think they're going to go to the league, they're going to play for 15 years. Mm-hmm. 100%. And, you know. Yeah. Um, you can still prepare them, like, yeah. as far as, like, pass it down, like, Oh, yeah, but skills. totally, yeah. But, yep. no, you know, r- like, r- what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to introduce him to some basic financial literacy. Right. right. Okay. Because he's in that mindset of, you know, um, I just want to, you know, be like the guys I see on Twitter and YouTube. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, that's a, that's a process. Yeah. So um, you know, we we do work on some some basic things. I I, I told him, you know, you know, you can own a part of mm-hmm. any company in the world. Right. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you wear Nike, don't you? He said, I love Nike. I said, well, you know, you can be an owner of Nike. 100%. Yeah, He's like, yeah. no, I can't. I said, yeah, you can. You just have to buy the stock. Right, right. And yeah. I, and so, you know, we, we talked about it and I said, you know, what, what company would you like to own? What a part of what company would you like to own? And I'll help you buy the stock. See, yeah. I don't think people really understand what stocks really are. Yeah. You know, especially in our community. I just think that you know, people think that it's just not for us, right? Yeah. But, you know, they don't understand that if you buy the stock that you actually own part of the company. You absolutely own part of the company. And yeah. I mean, it's, you know, and, you know, that's that's the kind of things that I think we need to make sure that kids understand is, you know, you can actually be an owner of a company, a publicly traded company, just by owning stock, right? Right, right. And so, you know, he chose Apple and I bought him some Apple and right. Apple split. And, you know, I asked him, right. what's, the, what's the price of Apple and how many shares do you own? And he kind of doesn't know. I mean, right. he's, 100%. Yeah. he knows he owns some Apple, but it's just a process. Right. Right. Yeah. It's just a process. And, and um, you know, but he's learning, you know, he's learning. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I try to give him as much education as I can, um, understanding that he's a 16 year old. Yep. Right. With 16 year old mind. And, um, you know, it's 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 just a process, though, man. Yeah. 100%, you know, it's 100%, a process, yeah. um, you know, and you have to kind of you have to meet them on their level. Right. 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 You can't lecture to them. It's kind of like, let me meet you on your level, man. Like, What are you what are you interested in? And, you know, you like Nike, then let's talk about what you can do with Nike. A hundred percent. You know, hundred percent. So. So back in, so 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 taking some steps back back to, you know, when you were thirty years old and you decided to go into the you know the wealth management, mm-hmm. uh, a career point. Um, t- tell us a little bit more about that about how you began your journey mm-hmm. uh, with that. I know you started with one firm and mm-hmm. just had to switch or switch firms. Yeah. You decided to to switch firms. Mm-hmm. Why did you do that? So, so mm-hmm. walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's you know, it's just like. Uh, um, anything, you know, you, you start in one place and you see something that may be a better fit somewhere else. Um, you know, I, you know, I was, I was looking at some stocks, um, and, you know, I really, really got interested in it during the financial crisis. In 2000, in 2006, 2008? Yeah. Around 2007 ish. Yeah. Seven ish. Yeah. And, you know, um, that's when I really, really got interested in it. But essentially, um, is that because everything was so low? Everything crashed. Right. Okay. okay right. Okay, okay. And but I, I feel like it's a little bit more risky too, though. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But that's when things, when things are depressed, that's when you buy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's how you, that's how you build wealth. You buy good companies that are on sale for whatever reason. Yeah. Okay. How do you know when things are on sale? How do you know when they hit the bottom? I think that this is, is the is is what makes us nervous about buying stuff. Yeah. You know, at low because what what if it go lower? You know what yeah. I'm saying? I mean, and, but your risk when something has been, you know, beaten to a pulp is so much lower than when things are at a high, even though it may go a little lower when you buy it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But the main thing is you have to know that you're buying a good company. Right. Right. right okay. Right. And, you know, that's, that's the thing, like, you know, during the financial crisis, Apple had, had gotten beaten down with everything else, but you've got people, you know, 
that are camping out in front of the Apple store to get the latest phone. So you know that their growth trajectory is, I mean, people are camping in tents to be the first to get the phone. And if you put some money down on Apple around then. I was talking to a gentleman that put maybe $150,000 into Apple. Around that time? Around that time. And um, that position now is worth about seven and a half million dollars. Yeah, <laughs> seven and a half million dollars. Yeah, and it just never touched it. Bought it, never touched it. You're you know? talking about the best investment you ever made. That's that's crazy. Yeah, and I mean, it's like it's it's just generational wealth, right? That you know was created off of a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollar investment. And they didn't do anything. They just bought it and went on with their life. But they had the hundred and fifty thousand dollars to buy it. Hundred percent. And they had it liquid. They right. had the ability to buy it. Right. And um, and that's the thing, man. Is just, you know, you have to control your consumption so that you have assets to invest. Hundred percent. Yep. You can't consume all of your all of your money. Right. 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 You can't have a consumption mentality. And that's the part that people struggle with because especially if they've come up, um, you know, and, and didn't have a lot of means. 100%, yeah. Right? It's like, okay, now I have it and I want to I wanna live. I want to spend. I want to have the nice car and the nice home and the nice clothes. And that's okay, but just make sure that you've got money to invest. I feel like now it's, it's even a bigger issue now because of the social media. You can compare yourself to everybody in the country now, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, he bought this nice car. Oh, I want that car now, right? Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Instead of instead of living by your means, you want to live off everybody else's means. Oh yeah. So yeah, how like do you do you see that as being one one of the struggles in the industry as well too? Is like just comparing yourself to everybody. Um. I think it's a struggle and I think it's something that we struggle with in the in the black community. 100%. Um, and I think that's a result of, you know, just not having as much financial literacy, mm -hmm. not having that generational wealth right. where you had that grandfather that sits you down when you're mm -hmm. 10 years old and says, you know, this is, let me, let me explain to you right how to how to build some wealth right or that father right that 100%. sits down with you and says let me explain to you how to build some wealth you know um you know i was later in life when i figured it out right right and you know my mother was even later than me when she figured it out and so i think that you know there's this there's this point at which we are at where we're starting to realize um, there's a better way to do this. Right. Um, and I think it's, it's this generation right here. Right, 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 right. And so that's why I think what, you know, this initiative is so important because, um, you know, I, I think we're at a point now where, uh, and, and not just, you know, I'm not just talking about African Americans, black people. I'm just, I mean, just in general, um, athletes, um, and, and just understanding how to make this work. Yeah, hundred right? percent. Better, hundred percent. Better, hundred yeah. percent. So you know, we back, we back, we go back to your journey. Yeah. You know about how you switch firms and stuff like that. Yeah. I really want to, really want to touch on the firm that you're at now. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> um, I don't think that other that a lot of people understand uh, the independence of it. Sure. You know how you can invest in outside investments as well too, even sure. with the firm. Sure. And how important that is you know, when you're deciding financial advice, you know, yeah. you know, uh, in my journey, um, I'll touch on it a little bit, how I, I went through about five or four or five financial advisors. Mm -hmm. Um, first couple just wasn't no good. Mm -hmm. You know, the second couple were a little bit more in those bigger financial firms to where I can mm -hmm. only invest in the things that they want me to. Mm -hmm. Uh, my third one, he actually had me in bonds, you mm -hmm. know, like during you know the COVID the COVID period when and when it was a a bull market when everything yeah. jumped up, mm -hmm. um, he had me like eighty percent in bonds. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I blame that on myself because I needed to be, I needed to be, um, 
I needed to know what what they were doing with my money. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I blame that on myself. So touch on like the firm that you are now, why you made the change, and why it's important when you're deciding a financial advisor or a financial advisor firm to look at the independence of it as well too. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I started with a small boutique firm um, and then I moved to a larger firm that had more resources um, and were heavily involved with 401k space, which is where I was operating at the time. And then that firm asked me to, because of my certification in, 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 mm-hmm. in wealth management, they said, we need you to spend some more time working with individuals and executives. And so I transitioned from working with company plans to individuals. And then the firm that I'm with now, that's their main focus is, right. is private wealth and individuals. And they have even more resources. 100%. But at each step, um, these firms were independent. Okay. Meaning that we weren't beholden to any particular um, investments that were branded for us. Mm-hmm. We could we could invest in what um, was best for our clients. And I've always found that to be important. That's super important. Yeah, um, you know, just being able to do what's best, um, not necessarily just what's appropriate, but what's best. Right. There's a difference. It is a big difference. And it's so difference. Um, the outcomes usually work out um, better that way. I mean, it's just been my experience. Um, and looking at the total picture mm-hmm. is important as opposed to just focusing on investments. Well, how do the investments fit into where you're trying to go? How do the investments fit into your total picture? Where do you want to be in 10, 15, 20, 30 years? And how do we structure the investments to get you there? Right. right Maybe right. you only need 7%. Maybe you need 12%. I don't know. We don't know until we know where you're trying to go and where you are and put the two together. 100%. Kind of reverse engineer it. Yep. Yep. And then in that bridge to figure out how to get you there, we can go and find the best right. solution. Right. 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 And we don't have to stick with like a, a particular um, uh, track. Right. It's just whatever's best. Right. 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 If, if this is the best fund, if this is the best strategy, we can do it. So that's that's always been important to me. And. Um, one of the big reasons that, you know, I, I, I chose to, to work with this firm. Um, it's a large firm and, um, you know, they're well resourced. They have access to pretty much everything. So, so, so as you're helping out, uh, your clients, so you reverse engineer, you, you, you more so, uh, work on things depending on where they want to get to instead of like where you think is best for them to get to. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's all about what they want, right? Right, 100%. What do you want? It's the first question. What do you want? Mm-hmm. Right. What's your vision? I'm not here to judge. Right, right, right. right. What, yeah. Just tell us what you want, okay? And we're going to help you get there. 100%. I've had yeah. people say, I mean, corporate executives, I'd, I'd like to own a shaved ice truck and do it <laughs> five days a week. I want to get out of this corporate world and I want to have my own shaved ice truck. Right. Let's make it happen. Right. Exactly. Okay. And so, you know, what is it going to take? Right. What is what is the lifestyle that you want? What is the lifestyle you want 10, 15, 20 years from now, five years from now, whatever the time frame is. Okay. This is the lifestyle you want. This is what it's going to cost. Mm-hmm. Adjusted for inflation because it'll cost more 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Right. Okay. What's that number going to take? What's what's the number that we need to fund that lifestyle? Where are you now? And then what is it going to take to get you there? What type of investment returns is it going to take to get you to that number? So you got to define the future. Right, right, right. Or else you're just investing in the dark. You understand? Right, 100%. Yeah. You're just trying to beat the market or trying trying to outperform the market and right. you know, and you don't even know if you have enough money. So you have to set the the goal or the objective first. Before Absolutely. you can even invest for the athletes. Absolutely. Or not the athletes, but for the clients. Yeah, it's just, yeah. It, or else it's, it's just a waste of time, I think. That's my, 100%. That's yeah. my take, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, when you know where you're going and you know what your average return is that you need to get there, mm-hmm. okay? And, you know, for the last two or three years, you've been outperforming what you need, 
because mm-hmm. the market has been on a rampage. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, and then you have a year like this year, right? 2022, mm-hmm. which is not so great of a year. It doesn't it doesn't affect you as much because you realize you're still ahead because 100%. you've had two or three great years leading up to this year. Well, when you don't know where you are, you just see your account values dwindling and you're like, okay, I didn't even know if I had enough in the first place. Right. And yeah. I, I know my accounts are down X and it's very, very stressful. 100%. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's much more peaceful when you've defined the end and you know what it takes to get there. 100%. So, I, I mean, I was going to wait to touch on this, but since you brought it up, like talk a little bit about the market now mm-hmm. and what you're seeing in the market now, the trends you're seeing in the market now. And then where do you think we're going to be at within the next 12 to 24 months? I mean, you know, you can never predict, you know, the markets. I mean, right now, um, you know, what's happening is, you know, we're we're getting ourselves back to a point of uh, of normal normalcy in terms of money flow. OK, mm-hmm. um, you know, COVID created a situation where they had to essentially print a lot of money that didn't exist. Yeah. And yeah. put it in people's pockets. Businesses. I don't think a lot of people understand that yeah, part of it. Yeah. Trillions. Yeah. That money that went into people's pockets for the, you know, the paycheck protection program and, you know, um, the unemployment assistance and all stimulus. And stimulus all check. Yep. That's all created money. Right? It just they created it. It just printed it and put it, it just, and put it, it, it just in. appeared. Correct. So all of a sudden you had this much money in the system and now you've got this much money in the system. And, you know, essentially you have a situation where um, all this money is chasing goods and services. 100%, yeah. And there's there's so much disruption in the supply chain because they shut the world down. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. And and it took a while to kind of get people back to work and there weren't enough people to build the furniture and the appliances and work it. I mean, it's just and that created just inflationary pressure. Right, right, right. Oh, you want a car? Well, we don't have enough computer chips for the cars that we're trying to build, so there's not enough cars on the lot. So if you want a car, you gotta pay up for it. Right, 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 right. right. And you saw, you know, used prices uh, used car prices going up and, and home prices, same thing, right? Mm-hmm. I mean everything just Every, everything just got inflated. And so the Federal Reserve um, basically came in and said, look, um, we've got to get this inflation under control. Right. And right? that's why they upped the rates. And that's all that, that's, that's exactly what it's happening. Yep, right. Yep, so the yep. Federal Reserve comes in and says, look, there's too much inflation. Uh, things are costing too much because there's too much money chasing too few goods and services. Right. Okay. Um, and so we've got to raise interest rates to, to bring the demand down. Okay. During that period of time, what do you think that, you know, and this is a very strategic question, but what do you think that the poor people did during that period of time? And then the rich people did during that period of time, <laughs> well, like, what did they invest in, you know, or like, yeah. you again, know, it's the consumption pers- versus the investment. Exactly. Right. And so, you know, if you. If you had, you know, some extra money from the stimulus and the unemployment, you know, assistance. Um, I mean, there's people that were making more money unemployed than they were making when they were working. I mean, it was a lot of scams going yeah. on. Around it. <laughs> right. And so there's a lot of money floating around. And, you know, you, you, you go to the mall and there's a line out the door for the Gucci store. Uh-huh. And, yep. You know, and it's like... So, I mean, again, it's the consumption, right? Yeah. Um, versus, you know, the people that looked and said, okay, wow, so stocks are very depressed. Mm-hmm. And um, we've had, a you know, basically a bear market in stocks and there's a lot of deals out here. 100%, yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, instead of going out and buying, you know, some, some Ferragamos, maybe <laughs> I'll buy some. <laughs> you know, some NVIDIA stock, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, but again, that's that's the difference, man, right? I mean, you've got to have a an investment mindset, um, you know, versus a consumption mindset. Yeah, yeah. And that's not easy for some people. It's not, man, especially, you know, and, and to be honest, like, it's so much, 
it's so much temptation to compare yourself to other people in this world right now. Mm -hmm. You know, everything you look at, you know, is somebody wearing some type of designer clothes, somebody driving a nice car, especially here in Dallas. You mm -hmm. know, back where I'm from is not as much. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I, I say it all the time, even when I go back home, you know, from Grandpa's, Michigan, people back there got more designer clothes than I got. Mm -hmm. You know, they literally wear more designer clothes than yeah. I wear. Mm -hmm. And it's sad to see it because, um, like I know I got more capital than them. Yeah. Like I know I have more assets than them. Right. But they but that's what they invest in. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's a sad thing because uh sometimes I feel like they invest in to look wealthy just because we're not or they're not wealthy. You right. know what I'm saying? Absolutely, man. And I mean it's what I'm saying. It's like um you know, and, and I and I've dealt with it myself. 100%. Right. Yeah. And I don't like to talk like I'm above people. I mean, I the a, a lot of the the advice that I give is from personal experience, from humble beginnings, yeah. From humble beginnings, right? I mean, um when I started in the entrepreneurial space, I was flat broke. Right, right. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I I stopped working in my my 9 to 5 corporate job and, you know, I went out and had to generate my own paychecks and it took right. a while to get started. 100%, yeah. And, um, you know, when I started making money, um, I remember, you know, wanting to spend it because I had been broke. You've been working so hard to, to get the money. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> look, man, I, I, I've been there, right? So I know what it, I've, I've, I've seen what it looks like to have wealth. And, and income, and I've seen what it's like to, to feel like you're, how you're going to make it. 100%. Yep. And when you start getting to a point where you have excess, not only do you have what you need, but you have excess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you feel like, oh, this will go on forever. Right, right. You yep. get trapped. Like, oh, you know, it's it's so easy, right, to feel like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, I can't run out of money. Yep, yep. I, every month I've got, I mean, look at all the money that I've got and you want to spend, mm -hmm. you want to spend and spending feels good. Okay. To buy something new, to buy something nice, you know, to drive something nice. Um, and you know, but the longer I started working in this business, the more I realized I really don't have anything. I just have right. stuff. Right, exactly, exactly. I need to have wealth, and there's a difference, okay? And what's the difference, though? Like, like you know what I'm saying? Because that's, that's right. important, you know? I, I, I haven't heard anybody put it like that. Like, I just have stuff. Right. You know, you yeah. know what I mean? I think that's key. Big time. I mean, okay, so um, if you have a Range Rover or a... I, I got one. <laughs> As soon as I said that, I was like, ah. I was like, ah. But no, I mean, it's tough, though. Like, you know, you're yeah. right. You're right. You're right. But if you you're have right. a Range Rover. I'm learning right now, too. Yeah. yeah. If you have, you know, you have a Range Rover, it is a nice truck. It is. It is. It's and everybody looks truck. at it when you're at the light or when you drive by. Like, that is a nice, that's a nice truck. You're right. Yeah. But it is a depreciating asset. It 100% is. You yeah. buy it for $130,000, you drive it and put 60,000 miles on it, and you will not be able to sell it for $130,000. 100%, yeah. Yep. You're going to sell it for some fraction of what you bought it for. A big fraction. Right. That is a that is just a thing. It is a depreciating asset, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's almost like it's a consumable, right? Like your clothes or your shoes. They're nice, right? They look good. They make you look good, but they're just they're just things. Right, right. Versus um, real estate, which is an asset that you buy it, and if you buy it right, when you go to sell it, it's going to more than likely be worth more than what you bought it for. Yep. Or is at least going to generate income for you. What's another example? Because I know every, everybody knows real estate, right? You know um, like, stocks. Yep. Okay. 
um, limited partnerships mm-hmm. in you know various projects. Right. Okay. okay. You don't have to go buy the whole apartment complex. You can be a limited partner in a fund that goes out and buys apartments. Yep. Yep. Okay. And you know, um, so there, there's there's a number of things like commodities. Yep. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's those are assets. Right. Right. Things that hold value or appreciate in value. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's that's the kind of things that you want to put your money in. Not saying that you don't live your life, but control it to the point where you can invest. Right. 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 And that's 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 the thing, um, and and I think people are con- you know they get a, they're they're afraid of investing because they don't know what they're doing. Well, that's why you hire somebody to help you. One hundred percent. Okay. Yep. But um, yeah, that's the difference, right? You got consumables, right. and then you have things that generate wealth, right? Cars, clothes, jewelry, it's consumables. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. Hundred uh, percent. Right. Um, assets. Right. Real estate. Limited partnerships. Stocks. Bonds. Right. Hundred percent. That yep. stuff builds wealth. Hundred percent. You know. And but you have to have. See, with a stock, it, it doesn't do anything for you, right? It's just what I mean by that is, you can't wear it, you can't drive it. It's just there. Right, right. If I take a hundred thousand dollars and I put it in stocks, it's just there, right, and you just yeah. have to know that that hundred thousand dollars is an asset that's going to grow. Yep. It's not going to generate fun for me right now. It's not going to look good on me. It. I can't drive it. Right. It's just there. So you have to have delayed gratification. Delayed gratification. And that's one thing that people don't understand. Yeah, is. yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, the hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollar investment in Apple in two thousand and six, two thousand and seven. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's money that could have been blown. One hundred fifty thousand dollars would be fun to blow, right? But instead, take the hundred fifty thousand dollars and invest it in a company, and leave it alone. Like it does. Like just forget about it. That turned into seven million dollars. That'll be fun. To, that'll be even more fun to blow. And it wasn't a long time. Yeah, it I wasn't. mean, we're talking about what is that? Fourteen years. Fourteen, 14 years. Yep, yep. Right. It sounds yep. like a long time, but it's yep, yep. Not really, right? Yep. And um, you know, so you have to have that delayed gratification. You have to have that, and, and that's what every entrepreneur, every you know, business owner. You know, it was, it was funny. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day and um you know and they were talking about somebody going off and starting their own thing mm-hmm. and i was like you know they, they got to have delayed gratification i don't yeah. know if they have that because they never they never had to experience a situation to where they had to rely on delayed gratification right and when i started my company you know i didn't get paid for the first two and a half years you mm-hmm. know and that's the majority of businesses you don't get paid for the first couple you know what I'm saying? A couple years. And that's delayed gratification. Totally. A lot of people can't wait that long. Right. You know? Because they want to consume. They want to consume. Yep. And exactly. that's, you have to check that consumption drive, right? That appetite for consumption. To generate true wealth, you have to check that. Yeah. It's kind of like if you want to have, you know, an elite body and be lean and mean and right, you can't eat what you want to eat. It's kind of like an ego thing too, huh? Yeah. A little bit? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, what, who are you trying to impress? Right, right. Yep, yep, yep. Most, most of, you know, the wealthiest, the wealthiest clients that we have, you would never know it. 100%, right, right. You would never. Not by the way they dress. Not by the way they dress. Not by their homes. I mean, you just can hardly tell. You can hardly tell. That's crazy. Yeah. That's but crazy. they have significant wealth. It's a book that talks about that. I think it's called The Million Millionaire Next, Next Door. Door. Yep. You can hardly yep. tell, man. And, you know, they take nice vacations and they have nice things, but they don't they're not they're not flashy. 
That's crazy. And you know, if you want, if if you want to have the flash, okay, just make sure that you set aside money to invest, okay? Because you know, just I mean, just thinking about an an, an athlete, right? A pro athlete. Um, to have that level of wealth, right? I didn't say wealth, income, cash flow, cash flow. Yep. At that young of an age, is an anomaly. They should be sending us. We should be sending aside more money than what we send aside. It's track. yeah. I mean, most people that have that level of 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 cash flow or income are well into their their forties. 50s and they may never get that level of I mean that's very unique um so to have that level of income at that young age is such a gift do you do you think that's why athletes run into a struggle a lot is because they 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 reach that they reach you know the pinnacle of what they you know of of their cash flow you know as, as a super super young age to the point that uh, they're not mature enough to be able to to manage it, you know. Do you think that's, that's oh, the absolutely, reason why? Yeah. absolutely, man. And you know, if you don't have someone that's got your best interest at heart to help you manage it, then it's easy to blow it. I mean, I, I think about you know my mindset when I was 20, 22, 21. You know, I'm not thinking right. about that kind of stuff. And unless I had someone around me kind of guiding me, um, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, it's easy to, to mess that up. But it is a, it's a huge, huge gift um, and because of the time value of money. 100%, yeah. If, yeah. if, if you make $2 million, $5 million, $6 million annually for five years, six years, right? I mean, you are at such an advantage if you can control your consumption. I'm not saying don't consume. Right, right. Okay, right. I'm not I mean, you know, I'm not going to say that because, you know, you have the ability to consume, but you also need to be very deliberate in what you invest. 100%, yeah. Because if you invest, you know, a, a good portion, a good solid amount of money, and I mean that it's 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 I mean I can make up a number if you invest $3 million at 25, 26, the numbers, I mean, I just told you about 150,000 in Apple, 14 years, what that did, okay? I mean, that's a generational investment. I mean, Apple right. is, is, yeah. is, is an amazing yeah. investment. They're not all like that, but you invest $3 million at 25, 26, I mean, the numbers are, are astronomical when you're 40, 50. Right. right. And I know it's hard to think in those terms, but man, I mean, but you have to, yeah. you have to, you have because to. Yeah. you're talking about the ability to be set for life. Hundred percent, right? Hundred um, percent. So, and you do a lot of work at SMU too, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I I teach um, I teach courses in the CFP program at yep. SMU, and I yep. run that program, um, and uh, that keeps me sharp. Yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, you know, because I'm basically um, instructing other financial advisors and and getting them the the knowledge competency that that I got, right, 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 right. so that they can go out and be um, superior, hundred percent, in terms yep, of their yep. their competency in terms of looking at someone's financial landscape. Yeah, that's right? big time. Yeah, that's, that's big it time. Is, it is. It's 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 a I'm, I was honored that they asked me to do that. So before uh, before we wrap up, you know, uh, uh, I want to touch on the Athlete Investment Academy a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously we're building out courses and stuff. It's going to start with the learn portion, you know, educate, and then an invest portion. Before we get into those portions, you you made it clear that we need to touch on the four pillars first, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So while we're here, do you mind touching on the four pillars, the four pillars of you know, before anybody invests in anything, mm-hmm. what they need to know or learn about their income, mm-hmm. or what you need to learn about their income. Yeah. 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 So, you know, when we started talking, it was, you know, I was 100% on board with, with um, you know, AIA and, and, its, and its mission. And 
I said, but we need to make sure that there's foundation, right? 100%, yeah. Um, and that foundation is, is very straightforward. Um, there's four pillars in order of importance when it comes to your finances, okay? And these are in, in, in order? In order. Okay. 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 Number one is liquidity, mm -hmm. okay? You have to have enough cash on hand, okay? And we'll talk about, you yep. know, we can talk about that when we actually get into the, the four pillars, but you've got to have enough liquidity. You have to, okay. Okay. Um, and, and people are like, that's number one? I'm like, yes. You've got to have enough liquidity to be able to deal with things that come up, okay? Things that come up as in... I mean, like... It could be something as simple as you look down at your tires and they're four bald tires. 100%. Yeah, I know. I feel you on that. Right? And yeah, it's like, right. yeah, it's like I need four tires and, you know, your tires may cost $300 a piece. A hey, Range Rover tires more than that. Right. <laughs> so you don't have any liquidity, right? <laughs> you got to come up with $1,200 for tires. 100%. If you don't have $1,200, what do you do? Swipe. Okay. Um, that's, that's really basic. Um, let's say it's something like, um, a catastrophic loss. Right. Okay. Um, you lose your job. Okay. COVID, right? A lot of people just, all of a sudden they don't have a job. I mean, it's instant, right? One day I had a job and then the next day I don't have a job because there's a virus. I mean, it don't matter to the, the government just going to print out a bunch. But that of money didn't get printed for a month and a half. Remember? You're right, you're right, yeah. You had to survive you're on right. your own for a month and a half until the checks started getting cut. You're right. Remember? Yep. Yep. Uh -huh. Um, or, or you get sick, okay, and you can't work, right? Um, and it doesn't have to be something, you know, um, that you think is like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to get sick. I, I, I talked to a lady one time. She had been discharged from the military because she had a brain infection, and she was out for a year. And I asked her, like, how did you get a brain infection? She was like, I got bit by a tick in a training exercise. Oh, wow. I was like, you got bit by a tick? She's like, yeah, I got bit by a tick. I got encephalitis, brain infection. I was out for a year, military discharge, career over. Crazy. Crazy stuff. So, and, and that kind of feeds into some of the other ones. But you just have to have liquidity for emergencies, okay? Um, or else you're going to go into debt. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. which kind of, you know, and I'll get into that. But number two is you have to protect your income because without income, nothing works, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've got to protect your income um, and, you know, income from you passing prematurely, income from you getting sick, okay, and not being able to work, whatever, you have to protect your income. Cause and that's in, like, just different vehicles that you can invest in or... Yeah, I mean, it depends on your situation. If you have a job, okay, then... You, you need to buy some insurance products. Yep. If you've got a business, um, you know, then, and you've got a key employee, you've got to protect that. Um, if you're the main revenue driver for your business, you've got to protect that. Right, right, right. right? right so right. if you go down for, you know, six months for something, mm -hmm. well, your business doesn't just die because you right. were down for six months. There's liquidity for your business if something happens. Right, right. Okay. Yep. So when you get back, you can pick up where you left off. Right. Um, and, um, you know, so, and then number three is revolving debt. You'd have to just, you'd have to eliminate it. Right. It's just, it's terrible. Okay. Credit card debt is Credit, ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. 20%, 25% interest rates is insane. And you've got to manage credit card debt because if you've got $40,000 of credit card debt and you're investing and you're over here paying 25% on $40,000 of debt, and you're investing over here, Right, right. they're competing, yeah. it's, it's bad, right. okay? And, and people don't really understand the difference between debt and credit. Yeah, there's, exactly. So there's revolving debt and credit card debt, and then there's the debt that you take on to build a business. 100%, yep. Right, which becomes a major asset for you. Right. Two totally different things, okay? There's two totally th different things between, you know, the credit card that you use to buy your Balenciagas and your Tom Ford, right? And you know the line of credit that you got or the loan that you got to build a business. Completely different. Totally yep. different. 
Right. And then number four is you got to put, you got to save for your retirement, right? Yep. You got to save for that day when you stop working. Right. 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 And, you know, whether that's as an athlete or as an entrepreneur or as an employee, there will come a day in which you're not doing what you were doing. Right. hundred percent. And you've got to fund the rest of your life. Right. And so, um, you know, that's, that's it. That's the four. So people are always like, so saving for my retirement is like way down the line. Yeah, it's number four. Right. Exactly. <laughs> because you got to get those three first in order before you can even get to that point. Yeah. I mean, think, I mean, you're saving for retirement, but you have $80,000 of credit card bills and, you know, you have no savings and, um, you know, you have nothing to protect you if you lose your job. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're, it's backwards, yeah. you see, because if something see. happens, right, like if you get sick, well, okay, um, I don't have any money, so I'm going to go take my money out of retirement, right? Or, um, you know, something happens, I don't have any money to pay for it, I'm going to go take money out of my retirement, or I'm going to go get into more credit card debt. Right. It's backwards. Right, right, right. right. So, it, yeah, it's number four, right? So, you know, and there's and that's the priorities. So everything that, you know, we do with our clients is, is kind of keeping that in mind. 100%, 100%. Yeah. Well, Brian, man, thank you so much. I mean, um, this has been, you know, amazing. A lot mm -hmm. of information has been passed around. So, yeah. you know, I hope y'all, I hope y'all tuned in to this one. Like, this is big time. Um, Brian, where, where, where can people find you? At? I don't think we ever uh, touched on the firm that you at. You yeah. Know, yeah. I don't think we ever shouted. Yeah. Out Beacon Point Advisors, uh, B-E-A-C-O-N point P-O-I-N-T-E dot com. Um, and I'm in the Dallas office. And, uh, you know, you can feel free to reach out to me with the contact information that's there. Happy to help out, provide advice, guidance. Um, so, yeah. 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 Thank you so much, man. Thank you for everything you've done for me. Absolutely. And also for joining this this podcast right Absolutely. now and being a part of the Academy as well, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. It's big time. It's it big is. Time. It is. Big, it's big time what you're doing, man. I appreciate you asking me to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate absolutely. you.